to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here with Bill Schofield and John Harrigan. Hey guys, how are you? Doing great. Yeah, swell. We're swell. <laughs> swell. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, great to be with you guys again. In our last episode, we looked at some of the Sermon on the Mount, and we fit it within a first century Jewish apocalyptic framework. And rather than it being understood in a universalized or spiritualized sense, we believe that it's best understood as Jesus preaching as a renewalist calling Israel to wholehearted Torah obedience in light of the coming day of the Lord. And so we worked through each section of the Sermon on the Mount, and we saw how Jesus was simply saying, hey, Israel, just do what the Torah says and do it authentically. Like, don't be hypocritical or don't be pretentious and don't play games like the Pharisees do. And we saw how throughout Matthew chapter 6, Jesus exhorted his hearers over and over and over again to live for the age to come and um, not for this age, like the Pharisees were doing. Um, and because as he would go on to say in chapter seven, there's consequences to not responding rightly to his words. And so specifically those consequences were eschatological consequences. And that's what he makes clear in his story uh, about the two houses. Um, at the end of Matthew seven, one builder had built his house uh, with his foundation on the sand and the other had built his house on the rock. And so when the storm came, it was clear which builder had heeded the words of Jesus because his house endured and didn't fall. And so I think this is a really good lead in to what we want to talk about today, which is the kingdom of God and Gehenna. And more popularly perhaps said, hell. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, but we want to look at the words of Jesus and see what he says about those, specifically those eschatological consequences for not responding rightly to his words. So let's get into this a little bit, guys. Like when we hear about hell, there's a lot of terms that can get thrown around, not just by scholars, but also by the average believer, like when we read the Bible. I mean, we read about hell and Sheol and the pit and all of these different terms, and there's really more than meets the eye in the English translation of the scriptures. And we're going to get into this a little bit, but I think a good place to start would be Mark chapter 9. And Jesus says this in Mark 9, verses 47 and 48. He says, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out, for it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So again, Jesus is tying together these two concepts of the kingdom of God and hell in this one specific verse. But guys, what's the deal with worms and fire? Like Jesus says, their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. What's this all about? Yeah. So the direct reference is from the end of Isaiah, the last verse uh, of Isaiah in chapter 66, where it talks about God making a new heavens and new earth and new Jerusalem. And, uh, and it concludes with, then the righteous will go out and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. And so this was, uh, understood in, in the eschatological sense that as the, opposite of what the righteous will inherit, the wicked will inherit eternal condemnation that is accompanied by fire and worms, which also gets developed in Second Temple literature quite a bit. So, for example, in the apocryphal uh, book of Judith, uh, you have in chapter 16 says, woe to the nations that rise up against my people. The Lord Almighty will take vengeance on them in the day of judgment. He will send fire and worms into their flesh. They will weep in pain forever. And similarly in Sirach, which is another apocryphal book, humble yourself, chapter seven, verse 17, humble yourself to the utmost for the punishment of the ungodly is with fire and worms. So this is uh, the language of Isaiah, you know, even specifically the fire and worms gets developed in Second Temple literature. We'll talk about more, but that's, uh, I think, uh, exemplary of Mark 9, why, why Jesus quotes Isaiah 66. Yeah. 
And, and like Josh mentioned, the word above Gehenna, which we'll develop more. Well, here you see um, that the ideas are very connected. And uh, the targum of that passage in Isaiah 66, and we've talked about the targums in past episodes, so it's a Aramaic translation with sometimes it elaborates on the text for various reasons. But in the Targum of Isaiah 66, it says, And they will go forth and look on the bodies of the sinful men who have rebelled against my memra. For their breaths will not die, and their fire will not be quenched. And the wicked shall be judged in Gehenna until the righteous will say concerning them, We have seen enough. So this is, this is, uh, this is where we're going to get a little bit of the connection between like Mark 9, the, the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, and what is a lot more prevalent in the New Testament, which we'll find lies behind a lot of the word, uh, a lot of the words normally translated hell, which is the word Gehenna. Yeah, Bill. So when we come to the New Testament, I think we have to understand the terminology here. Um, often, you know, like you said, we have one word that's that's translated by English translators as hell, but there's multiple words in the Greek, especially in the New Testament here. You get the word Gehenna, which we'll develop a little bit more in a minute here, um, but the word Hades is also developed. So these words are often just translated as one English word, hell, but this really obscures the meaning, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, it does on a number of levels, <clears throat> as we'll see. Um, like, uh, it, it, it reminds me a little bit of how English translations since the time of King James have translated the, uh, the word ecclesia as church, um, despite the fact that that's not what ecclesia means. But so in a similar sense, like translating Gehenna and Hades, traditionally Hades was also translated as hell. Now a lot more translations will actually translate Hades, but um, and in and there's the obscure reference to Tartarus in Second Peter, I believe, and so those things are to translate all of those as hell from the perspective of a, of, of a second or a second temple Jew. Jews in the first century knew kind of the conversation about these things, and they were not all talking about the same thing. Right. And so it's, it's misleading to just simply translate the, all of the concepts as hell because there's a lot of difference. Yeah, I think, I think what it reflects is basically, you know, post whatever, fourth, fifth century onward in which you have kind of uh, an abandonment of the Jewish apocalyptic narrative. You have a Hellenization of the worldview on a broad level. And basically all you have is the material and immaterial world and everything negative gets pushed into the immaterial world. And so Sheol's negative, Hades is negative, Tartarus is negative, Gehenna is negative. So it's all just in the immaterial, uh, you know, supernatural world later on as it gets uh, termed. And, uh, but in a first century uh, Jewish apocalyptic worldview, the, they're different realities. Gehenna is an eschatological reality. And Sheol, Hades, those are the same thing. They're a temporal reality that is is present. And so every time you get a reference to Gehenna in the New Testament, it's always in an eschatological context because it's it's presumed to accompany the eschatological judgment. And so, and this is reflected, for example, in Revelation twenty, when at the great at the final judgment, it says death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and they were judged each one. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And so Hades or Sheol is something that is a temporal reality, a holding place for the dead, that then there's a final judgment and Gehenna is the eternal judgment with fire. Uh, which we'll kind of go into, I think, more. And just to clarify real quick, the the Hades and Sheol. Um, so Sheol is the is something that is 
uh, it's a Hebrew word, so it's used all throughout the Tanakh. And Hades is the way that word is translated in the Septuagint. And right. so when it's brought forward, it's the it's the idea of Sheol that is brought forward. And so that we'll have a little bit more of that conversation in a bit too. But that's if you those aren't different things. Those are generally the same Hades and Sheol. Yeah. Hades and Sheol the same, but different from Gehenna, which yeah, we keep saying we're going to get into Gehenna. Right. Yeah, we're, we're going to get into this in let's a second. Let's get into it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let, well, let's get into it. I mean, I think even, but before we get into it, I, I think a good example of this, you know, the way that we often read and and hear the word hell, even like Jesus's words in Matthew 23, for instance, Matthew 23, 33, Jesus is speaking and this massive condemnation on the Pharisees. And he says, you're going to be sentenced to hell. And, you know, this is the way the ESV puts it. Another translation, like the NIV, would say condemned to hell, or the uh, the New Living would say, I think, a, a better translation, which is the judgment of Gehenna, because the Greek word used in Matthew 23, 33 is Gehenna. And so, you know, again, this, this just causes us, when we hear the word hell, typically in the West, we assume a metaphysical or a present reality versus how a first century Jew would have heard it, heard it as an eschatological reality, mm. day of the Lord, judgment, um, final judgment, this kind of thing. And and, uh, and and so I think with this in mind, we can jump into a little bit more of the the origins of the word Gehenna, the Greek word Gehenna, and how this would come in from the Old Testament. Okay, so if we jump in now, like looking at some passages like 2 Kings 23, 2 Chronicles 28 and 33, as well as Jeremiah 32, we see a place in these passages called the Valley of Hinnom or Topheth. And it's it's a valley or a place outside of the city of Jerusalem where in these passages in 2 Kings and, and Chronicles and Jeremiah, sacrifices to Molech were made under King Solomon, King Ahaz, and Manasseh. And this was not a good place. This, the Valley of Hinnom was not a good place uh, where idol worship was happening, where ba- really bad stuff was happening. Later on, we see in Jeremiah 7, verse 32, and Jeremiah 19, verse 6, that this is the Valley of Hinnom is the place where Jews were thrown during the siege from the Babylonians. And, uh, and so this characterization of the Valley of Hinnom being a place of judgment just again, a, a valley right outside of Jerusalem is where this term finds its origin in the Old Testament prophets. Yes, good. So, um, so Gehenna, as it's as it comes down in the new in the New Testament, is a transliteration of a of a, a Hebrew word into into Greek, and <clears throat> so the 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 or the the Hebrew word is the word ge. Or valley, uh, Hinnom, uh, Hinnom, the valley of Hinnom, or sometimes more common is it's it's uh, Ge Ben Hinnom, which is the valley of the son of Hinnom, like in Joshua fifteen. Then the boundary goes up by the valley, the Ge of the son of Hinnom, Ben Hinnom, and then just below it uses the word Ge Hinnom. So Ge Hinnom basically gets gets that the 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 word generally gets preserved, but it gets it gets changed just a little bit from Gehenom, the Valley of Hinnom, to Gehenna by the time it reaches the Septuagint and and some of the new the the text in the New Testament. So it, like Josh said, Gehenna references the Valley of Hinnom just outside of the city of Jerusalem that everybody would have been aware of at the time. Yeah, I think Isaiah 30 is definitely a big one um, just because it's so direct. So Isaiah 30 verse uh, 30 says, The Lord will cause men to hear his majestic voice, and they'll make them see his arm coming down with raging anger and consuming fire with cloudburst, thunderstorm, and hail. Verse 33, Topheth, which is a place within the Valley of Hinnom, that's the specific spot where they offered uh, uh, offered to the foreign gods. Um, and so Topheth has long been prepared. It has been made ready for the king. Its fire pit has been made deep and wide with an abundance of fire and wood. The breath of the Lord like a stream of burning sulfur sets it ablaze. And so this is where you get a lot of the language of 
uh, fire and brimstone and sulfur is out of Isaiah 30. And the Targum for uh, verse 33 of Isaiah 30, specifically, it substitutes instead of Topheth, it says, for Gehenna has long been prepared in view of their sins. Indeed, the eternal king, referencing the Messiah, has made it ready to to fit the narrative of the Messiah will come to judge the living and the dead. And so the Messiah has prepared Gehenna for the sins of the wicked with with uh, fire and brimstone. Yeah, that also brings to mind um, another reference from the Targums in Isaiah, which which also incorporates another idea from the New Testament that people associate with um, the final judgment that we're more familiar with from the book of Revelation. It's mentioned a few times there is the second death. So here you see the two concepts connected. Again, connecting Gehenna, or what is sometimes translated hell in the New Testament, with the second death, or the eschatological judgment. So uh, Isaiah, uh, Targum Isaiah 65, uh, starting in verse 5, their retribution is in Gehenna in which the fire burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not give to them a respite in life, but will repay them retribution for their sins, and I will hand over their bodies to the second death. So there you see, and there's a number of times, we were talking earlier, five or six times, where this this phrase, the second death, appears in, uh, in the Targums, which basically gives you the introduction of what the book of Revelation, I think it's four times in the book of Revelation, uses the language second death. So you can see all of these ideas of this eschatological judgment are are kind of intertwined in these in the language of Gehenna and second death and things like that. Yeah, and I think second death uh, also, because you have such a theme in Jewish apocalyptic literature of basically eschatology is the reversal of protology. And so there's a, a, a consistent emphasis on Adam, that Adam is how all of this mess got started, and therefore the Messiah is going to come and he's going to reverse it. There's going to be a new creation and a, and a, 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 a setting things to right as they were in the beginning. And so I think the language of Gehenna, you get a number of references to the second death because death entered in after the first sin. And so there's there's two major events in history, which is protology and eschatology, the creation and the day of God. And so uh, that language, I think that reflects that emphasis on protology uh, in the Second Temple period. Yeah, guys, good points, good point. real good points. Well, if we move on now from our cursory glance at the Tanakh and how Gehenna or the Valley of Hinnom or Topheth is understood in the Tanakh as a valley outside of Jerusalem that will be reserved for the eschatological judgment uh, of which the Messiah himself will administrate. How is this brought forward into Second Temple literature? And specifically, did the meaning or, or the, the ideas change, or how does this all work? Like, how is this developed in the Second Temple period? Yeah, the, uh, just a quick note on the on the concept, just before I jump into that, guys, on the concept of something developing in the Second Temple period. So I know that can be like a little bit confusing for some people to think of it. So, <clears throat> you know, it reminds me of 1 Peter 1, where it talks about the, the prophets making uh, careful inquiries into the timing and to who would be the Christ. And <clears throat> so, so the, the fact is, is that after the oracles are given, there is this period of search and inquiry trying to figure out what what exactly, how those things are going to play out. Because these guys aren't biblical scholars, right? They're, th- this is like boots on the ground. This affected the way they approach things and, and decisions they made. Like... Um, <clears throat> like, uh, what, what, what's the passage? I don't have it in front of me, but it's in Tobit 14, I believe, where he tells his son Tobias 
that he has to, he's getting ready to die. And he says, you know, what you need to do is you need to leave because, because of the judgment pronounced by the prophets, those are certainly going to come. And so you can't be, you can't live here when that happens, when the judgment comes on Babylon. And so as they're trying to like figure out how to, how to, what the oracles mean and how they play out, there's a conversation that happens. And well, I shouldn't say a conversation. There are a number of conversations that happen. And, and what we have in the New Testament, this is the reason we bring it up, is because a lot of what we have in the New Testament is Jesus and the apostles really highlighting one conversation in there. And basically, in, in, in this way, a lot of what they're doing is they're saying, this is really the inspired conversation that, that goes through this period um, after the time of the prophets. And this inspired conversation happens, and Jesus essentially brings things like Gehenna, which were being talked about by other people, but things like Gehenna and, and what we now call, especially here on this show, uh, apocalyptic eschatology. And he takes those things and he basically says, this really is the heart of what was being, what was intended from the beginning. And then, of course, when he, you know, comes out of the grave, you know, his, his view really is, is understood as, okay, that's, you know, he's not just another rabbi with just another view in the room. He's, he's the guy who really understands what's going on. So that's when we talk about Second Temple development. We're just acknowledging that there is a conversation after the period of the Tanakh and that Jesus picks up on it and he really highlights that, that this conversation really nailed the heart of what was being given in the oracles. So that's all we mean by that. Yeah, I can't, I can't think, uh, you, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of any other book or writing at the time that talks about hell more than Jesus. Yeah. I, no, yeah. yeah, there isn't for sure. Maybe, maybe second Enoch, but I don't, I'm, I don't know. I haven't, this isn't something that I've like researched, but as I, as I just think about it, I've I, heard that though. It's true. You have heard that. Okay. So it's not just me. Yeah. So if that is true, then you, you have a, a theme that is particularly highlighted even more than, other Jews are talking about, but it goes undefined. And so yeah. if your yeah. eye causes you to sin, then gouge it out because it's better to enter the kingdom of God maimed than it is to be thrown with your whole body into Gehenna. I mean, this is like life and death. Right. This, this is, this isn't like a, a marginal, you're not arguing about how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, you know, <laughs> as it, as it rhetorically goes, but you're talking about life and death. This is the big totally. thing. Like this is the big right. thing, yeah. but there's no definition about what it is. And so this is an example of why we talk about Second Temple literature, both canonical, both, not, you know, what would be termed now as deuterocanonical, canonical, apocryphal and pseudepigraphal, what they wouldn't, what no Jew in the first century would understand as as canon, but definitely still inspired since there's, you know, that many uh, copies of it. But anyway, so back to uh, back to references to the ideas about uh, get back on track. Um, I just wanted to read, uh, I think, 4th Ezra 7 is most pertinent to uh, or one of the most pertinent passages to Gehenna because it's so directly contrasted. Fourth Ezra seven is is definitely a, a, a well known messianic passage, and so it says in in light of the judgment, the coming day, verse thirty two. It says the earth shall give up those who are asleep in it, and the dust those who rest there in silence, and the chambers will give up the souls that have been committed to them which is kind of a reference out of Isaiah 26 and, and, and Sheol or Hades, where they had this idea of, of the righteous and the wicked both being held for judgment independently until the coming day, and then the resurrection, they would be brought up out of the chambers. Um, so verse 33, the Most High shall be revealed on the seat of judgment, and compassion shall pass away, and, pati- and patience shall be withdrawn 
Only judgment shall remain, truth shall stand, and faithfulness shall grow strong. Rep- recompense shall follow, and the reward shall be manifested. Righteous deeds shall awake, and unrighteous deeds shall not sleep. The pit of torment shall appear, and opposite it, the place of rest. And so, you know, the kind of opposing of the kingdom and, and Gehenna. The furnace of Gehenna, the furnace of hell shall be disclosed and opposite it, the paradise of delight. Then the Most High will say to the nations that have been raised from the dead, look now and understand whom you have denied, whom you have not served, those whose commandments you have despised. Look on this side and on that. Here are delight and rest and there are fire and torments. Thus he shall speak to them on the day of judgment. And so this is a very kind of Matthew 25 uh, description of the day of God and the, the, the very stark kind of black and white view of it. Yeah, yeah. Really intense passage there, John. And another one I think of, again, that highlights this eschatological reality of the day of judgment of Gehenna uh, is First Enoch 100. Uh, and this is starting of verse 4. It says, the Most High will arise on that day of judgment, again, an eschatological theme, in order to execute a great judgment upon all the sinners. Woe to you, verse 7, sinners, when you oppress the righteous ones in in the day of hard anguish and burn them with fire. You shall be recompensed according to your deeds. Of course, referencing um, Jesus, or Jesus references, it says yeah. this very same thing uh, several times. Woe unto you, you heart of heart, you uh, who are watchful to devise evil. Fear shall seize you, and none shall come to your aid. Woe unto you, sinners, because of the works of your hands, on account of the deeds of your wicked ones, in blazing flames worse than fire it shall burn." And again, just uh, a, a development of this thought and this idea of the eschatological, uh, eschatological judgment and of Gehenna, uh, uh, referencing again the day of judgment um, for the unrighteous um, and the unrepentant. Yeah, yeah, those are, yeah, those are pretty fiery, um, super intense. Yeah, very, very, uh, very descriptive, almost, almost poetic. Makes you wonder why people haven't written some worship songs using some of these passages. <laughs> Maybe we could send four Ezra not, to Phil Wickham or something. That's not funny, Bill. It's <laughs> not funny. Um, another one uh, is uh, sibling oracles. Uh, sibling oracles uh, in uh, second volume. All these. Um, I'm in uh, in line starting in line two eighty nine. So all these referencing the wicked at once, the angels of the immortal, everlasting God will punish terribly from above with whips of flame, having bound them around with fiery chains and unbreakable bonds. Then in the dead of night they will be thrown under many terrible infernal beasts in Gehenna where there is immeasurable darkness, but when they have inflicted many punishments on all whose heart was evil, then later a fiery wheel from the great river will press them hard all around because they were concerned with wicked deeds. They all will gnash their teeth, wasting away with thirst and raging violence. So again, just the language is super intense or the descriptions are, are really, really intense, but it's important. This conversation is important because a lot of these ideas, blazing fire, blazing flames worse than fire, you know, wasting away with thirst and raging violence, a lot of these ideas get important. The gnashing of teeth. You get the gnashing yeah, of oh teeth yeah, oh yeah. there. You, that's a direct and reference. Darkness. Yeah. And and so yeah, and the darkness reference there as well, which which Jesus references. But the whole body of ideas of everything we just read, the ideas, the concepts are alive in people's minds when they hear Jesus referencing Gehenna. Yeah. And so that's that's why the conversation, the Second Temple period, is important, is because, like we've said a number of times, if the conversation is clear. During, you know, throughout the period between the, the, you know, the prophets and the time of Jesus is what these things mean is clear. Unless there's a clear redefinition, then the most logical 
explanation is that when Jesus references Gehenna, he's referencing all of these ideas in the audience. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it, Bill. And so, therefore, I think this can bring us right back to Mark chapter 9, where, again, this is a passage I read right at the beginning, but we see Gehenna, once again, Gehenna and the kingdom of God are contrasted directly in this passage, where Jesus, again, would say, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and be thrown into Gehenna, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. And so, again, a first century Jew hearing the words of Jesus will understand this and go, wow, this is an eschatological reality. Uh, this is not a good thing. I either, based on my response to the words of Jesus, I either repent and inherit the kingdom, or I don't repent and I inherit Gehenna. <laughs> and this would not have been a good thing. Um, and, and the first century Jew would have understood these things clearly um, from you know, not only the development in Second Temple literature, but also from the prophets themselves. Yeah, and this kind of brings up the idea that Jews viewed the eschatology as a package deal. It all came together tied to the great day of God, the day of Yahweh, is the judgment, the resurrection, Gehenna, the punishment of the wicked, eternal life for the righteous. So, there, this whole uh, strange phenomenon that somehow one part of it is realized while the other part is not. The kingdom is now, but Gehenna is not now. This is this would all just be strange and foreign, a breakdown of the basic uh, framework of history of two ages and the day of God. It, it, it wouldn't be. Uh, setting the day of God as it actually is, as the as the as the final climax, and so yeah. uh, I think just you know looking at a few passages, which I think we're going to do here, you, will illustrate that these two, the resurrection kingdom and Gehenna, go they all go hand in hand, and and there's no separating them. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. right. Totally logical. But it's amazing what you can do with an already, but not yet, because you get to Easy. you get to choose everything <laughs> that's already and everything it's, that's not yet. Uh, it's true. It's awesome. That's true because because and this really is. I mean, this is this is preterism to a large degree. Preterism yeah. is yep. just the is the realization of the negative aspects of the covenant, right? Covenantal discipline. Uh, which, you know, got pushed to its climax in the day of God in Gehenna at the time. But then modern, you know, theology will argue for the realization of that at 70 AD negatively yeah, at, right. yeah. as the backside of the positive realization of eschatology. Right. Yeah, good point. But nobody, but nobody will say it directly for some right. reason. I, I think it would, I think it would be clarified if they would say seventy A.D. is the realization of Gehenna. But nobody yeah. says that. Yeah, good point. Um, Matthew eight's another another one where the two are clearly um, they're contrasted at a point in history, um, and moreover, it's very much. Though it's as though everybody understands that, right? It's not like a teaching that he's giving them that everybody's mouth is hanging open. They they all clearly understand what he's saying. In Matthew 8, starting in verse 10, Truly I tell you, no one in Israel I have found, no, nowhere in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think we have an upcoming episode on the eschatological banquet, which will be awesome. Yeah. But, so that can... The feast... <laughs> And uh, so that continues in verse 12, while the sons of the kingdom, so they will be gathered and they'll come and they'll eat at the table, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there's a banquet going on while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. And so the the two are clearly contrasted as an eschatological reality, but really as as contrasting eschatological destinations for the righteous and the wicked. Yeah. Yeah. Similar thing Jesus does in Matthew 10, just a couple chapters later, he's talking or sending out the 12 and, and setting them up for 
a difficult mission, but in using some other words to encourage them. Just a few verses before, this is Matthew 10, verse 26. He says, so have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark and say in the light and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And verse 28, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. And, you know, translated hell in modern English translations, but uh, the word here in Greek is Gehenna. And so, again, mm. the encouragement to his disciples to go, hey, I'm going to send you out and you're going to encounter a lot of resistance. And in that resistance, don't be afraid of the people that, you know, might want to destroy you and and put a, a sword through your torso and spill your blood. But fear the one who can throw you into the eschatological judgment of Gehenna. Um, remember that there is a resurrection coming. And so again, tying all these themes of the eschatological reward and the eschatological judgment together in this passage in Matthew chapter 10. Yeah, a few chapters later, you also get, you know, the parables uh, chapter and the weed and the weeds and the wheat and the tares, uh, the parable that concludes with the Son of Man coming with the angels and gathering all the the those who cause sin, the lawbreakers, and throwing them into the fiery furnace. Uh, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. And so you have a, a similar kind of the, the parables are used to emphasize the eschatological destiny, which we talked about this in the parables episode uh, before. And uh <sighs> You know, last one that comes to mind is the is the one where, you know, this is usually the first one that comes to mind to me when you when you want like a real direct contrast between the the destiny of the wicked and the righteous. But often we don't make the connection that it's like the the appointment happens on the day of judgment, and that's and that really it really takes. Uh, Kind of where you have the the eschatological kingdom and the eschatological fire contrasted is Matthew twenty five. <clears throat> so starting in in verse thirty four, you know the the you know he says to the righteous, you know you who you know visited me and you clothed me and you gave me to eat and everything. Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Right personified as the as the sheep on the right. And then to the goats on the left, a little bit later in verse 41, he says, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then, uh, again, prepared for the devil and his angels is also a big part of the second temple development. And we've read a couple relevant passages, but that's a big part of it. But uh, then lastly, it just real concisely, these will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous on to eternal life. So it's another another good example of the, these two are inseparable concepts as far as um, when they take place, like all over the New Testament and it's all over Second Temple literature and really all over the prophets as well, that this judgment of Gehenna is something that takes place Again, like we highlighted at the beginning, on the earth, and uh, it happens eschatologically when the kingdom of God is established. Yeah, I think, you know, what comes to my mind is just that it's it's uncomfortable, the, the whole conversation. Like, when you look at the passages, it's... Yeah. No kidding. It doesn't... It, it, it's... Uh, what's the word? It's unrefined. Yeah. It's like it's like yeah. an obnoxious yeah. holiness preacher that is it is it's fire and brimstone and it and yeah. it it doesn't fit well. It fits well within a first century Jewish apocalyptic context, but it doesn't fit well within kind of refined circles. It's like a jackhammer, you know. It's yeah. just like ah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that's why it ends up, you know, it ends up either just not getting talked about um, or it ends up getting kind of redefined. Yeah. Uh, which yeah, I think is it doesn't doesn't do justice to either the text or to reality yeah. itself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, guys. Well, so what? Um, we've seen how this is developed from 
the words of the prophets to the Second Temple literature to now the words of Jesus um, as an eschatological reality that the day of judgment is real. Uh, there's a real valley that outside of Jerusalem would be filled with fire and uh, the wicked will be thrown into it <laughs> on the day of judgment. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what do we do? How do we respond? So what? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, comes to mind, I've been thinking the last few days about Acts 17 and and when Paul goes through after he leaves the synagogue in uh, in Athens, and he's going through the city and he's just he's vexed by their idols and uh, and so he goes to Mars Hill, which is where where he gets an audience with a bunch of pagan philosopher types, and what he feels like needs to happen in terms of them understanding the gospel, which is what you don't get elsewhere. And you know the the at least not ex, not as overtly in the other sermons that the Book of Acts records is he needs to explain history for these guys because that's the problem is they don't know where history's going they just think that everything is about these concepts that they're trying to grasp mentally so that they can whatever so that they can transcend um, you know the the pain of existence and. But they don't see history as going anywhere. And so what really strikes me about this is this is a major part of where history is going. And it actually helps to portray a a robust picture for the gospel to actually take root. You know, like Matthew 7 also comes to mind, like we mentioned last week, where you have, you know, the two foundations is, is highlighting... You know the 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 wind and the rains and the storms and everything. It's highlighting apocalyptic imagery for the day of judgment. And so, when Jesus says something like that, and he evokes this view of history and a coming judgment, all of these ideas are coming to mind at the same time. You know, he obviously references Gehenna a number of times in the Sermon on the Mount, but then he just brings it. And the punchline is is those that listen and say amen, but don't obey my words, they're going to be destined for fire. And the ones that do, they're going to be destined for eternal life. That's like, that's what a first century Jew would have heard because of a a robust and a real comprehensive view of where history was headed. And so my takeaway is just like allowing this to just, uh, to just actually paint like a more broad picture of where history is going so that we can just read Jesus' words and go, whoa, like that's serious. And and we can actually have the fear of God ourselves. <laughs> right. We don't we don't have to figure we don't have to figure them out. Yeah. We just have to like respond. Yeah, totally. <laughs> the, yeah. the real problem. It, it, the real problem. Yeah. So that's that's basically <laughs> what comes to mind. Is that just in in the fear of God that we would learn how to respond, and then also guide others in how they ought to respond. It's just just to have the fear of God, you know, come as a result of the more robust picture of where things are going. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, man. I mean, one of the things we emphasized in our last episode on the Sermon on the Mount was an authentic response. Um, a, a, you know, kind of a, a you, you coined it pretty well, John, like Jesus is cut the crap sermon. <laughs> and, mm. uh, and in essence, like this is, this is my takeaway is in light of a real day of judgment, real eschatological consequences on that day in the future, you know, and, and even as we talked about in our episode in the parables, um, God is allowing both the righteous and the wicked to grow together until the day of judgment, that this is why a right, appropriate, um, uh, correct, and, and authentic from the heart response to the words of Jesus really matters because there are real consequences, though they may not be visible or may not you know, necessarily happen in this age, Jesus is continually warning of a real day of judgment that is coming. And so a response matters, uh, and, and appropriate and, and a from the heart authentic response really matters, um, because there are eschatological consequences. And so that's my takeaway. Yeah. I think I'm similar, um, just as far as the, the, the gospel doesn't, um, 
the 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 clearer the negative is, the clearer the positive is. So there is no uh, real clarity to what the cross meant to the apostles without clarity on what the punishment meant yeah. at the day of God. And so the the backside, the negative side of uh, Jewish eschatology clarifies the positive of what, uh, of why Jesus came, why the Messiah came a first time before a second time to bear sin before bringing salvation. And so the reality of Gehenna makes the gospel that much more. And like Paul said in Second Corinthians 5, when he, you know, he talked about we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for what we've done in the body, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we seek to persuade others. And we are ambassadors and, uh, you know, of reconciliation as he goes on to talk about. So it, w- without the, the, without clarity on the negative realities of eschatology, you, you can't really have clarity and on the positive and you lack the, the motivation to persuade others. It just becomes ideas. It doesn't become a reality that, that drives you to, uh, seek to save people from the coming wrath. So. I think it's critical, yeah. critical Amen. to discipleship and witness. Amen. Yeah. Good. Amen, guys. Well, um, this has been a, definitely a little bit of a um, weightier episode in terms of uh, the language that's that has been developed by the prophets and by Second Temple literature and by Jesus Himself, and uh, and that's good. I I think that weightiness is important to frame. Jewish eschatological expectation rightly, and therefore our eschatological expectation rightly, that the God of Israel is going to do everything he said, including the day of judgment, including um, the the reality of Gehenna. Amen. So with that said, um, we hope that this has been provoking to you, our listeners, and uh, we look forward to continuing in our series here on the kingdom, developing a little bit more of uh, episode next time. We plan on working through the the eschatological banquet and the feast of the righteous and what that will mean for us who rightly respond to Jesus's words. So with that said, John and Bill, it's been great to be with you. Listeners, thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. Maranatha. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.